Welcome to chapter 25. So this is the second part of unit eight. And honestly, I think this chapter really belongs just as an additional section in chapter 24, because it's really just looking at the social history of the 1950s, where in um, the previous chapter, we were talking about the origins of the Cold War and its expansion and in, in, uh, foreign policy and how that changes in the United States. Uh, during the 1950s, where we are in this just intense rivalry with the Soviet Union. So what we're looking at today is uh, what's going on within the United States during the 1950s. For the most part, that's going to be a discussion of what we call conformity, where people are, um, through mass media, becoming more unified in what's popular in different regions of the country. You're going to have People with jobs making more money than ever before. They're out spending it on a lot of these consumer items. And then there's also a movement more of the, the growing middle class out to the suburbs and what that means for urban areas. So let's go ahead and begin to look at chapter 25. Um, notice the, the dates here. We've got 1945 to 1963. So we're right at the end of World War II. And then 1963 is going to take us into um, the, the changes that occur with race relations and um, the counterculture in the 1960s. So as we begin to look at this, there is, um, you know, in the background of all of this that's going on in the 1950s with prosperity and the new consumer items, there's still in the background this rivalry with the Soviet Union. And one way that we see this play out is actually in what were known as the kitchen debates. So you'll remember that um, Richard Nixon was Eisenhower's vice president and he had used his popular hunt for the communist in the Alger Hiss case to really kind of launch his, his national political career. So as vice president, um, there is, again, very, very much a growing rivalry in all things with the United States and the Soviet Union, including the space race, the arms race. And there was also a competition for who has the, the better standard of living for their citizens. And the, in 1959, there was almost like a cultural exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States to kind of, of help the people on both sides of this rivalry understand the, um, the situation of their enemy, if you want to call them that. And so there was this exposition called the American Exposition that was going to open in Moscow in the summer of 1959. And it was basically a model home that would show what the typical American life was like so that the people of the Soviet Union could have a better understanding of that. So when this opens in 1959, um, Richard Nixon goes and represents the United States at the opening of, of this um, exposition and Nikita Khrushchev is there. And so they, they are, the media is all around and they're touring this home and they get into the kitchen and it has all of these new appliances that are very popular in the US in 1959, the washing machine, the electric stove, the um, coffee pot, you know, the toaster, all of these different electrical appliances that have become fairly commonplace for the average middle class family. And Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon get into an argument about whether or not that is truly a representation of what most Americans have access to. So you can see in the bottom left hand corner how this does kind of get a, a little intense where the translators are going back and forth. Uh, and Khrushchev is questioning Nixon and he's having none of it and he's fighting back. Of course, this is what the average American life is like. Um, later on, there is a similar type of exposition that is going to be in, I believe it was in New York where the Soviets kind of set up their demonstration uh, of what life was like in, in the Soviet Union. So this just goes to again, underscore this constant rivalry between the two sides during the Cold War, even when it comes to standard of living within the United States. We have a, a much larger middle class that results from World War II. You can see the, the growing average income um, or, or wealth proportion of the, the wealth in the United States. 
by this bottom part of the population that it's growing. So that means that we have a much higher standard of living for the lower classes because they do have more money available to them. All right, so as we start to look at this prosperity, look at this picture. This is from one of the new types of uh, subdivisions that become popular among the middle class that is moving out to the suburbs. So they are with the uh, car and the automobile able to live farther away from their place of business. They have more money that they're making and homes become more affordable in some of these um, subdivisions. You, if we look closely, every one of these houses is identical to the other. So it's almost like this idea of mass production of homes that if you can almost make it like a kit, um, you cut down the price because you know exactly how many windows, how many doors, how many um, boards, you know, everything is, is standard in, in these houses in this neighborhood and it makes them more affordable. And so the middle class begins to move out to the suburbs, which we'll get into in just a few minutes. All right, so the economic situation of the United States, we know that coming out of World War II, the US is in the, the most stable situation of the, the European nations and the, the leading nations in the world. And the US takes a leadership role in trying to, to rebuild this economy for the world. So within the United States, we've got um, the, the emphasis now is shifting back in favor of labor. So we had seen during the progressive era that labor was being um, supported largely by the government with those progressive reforms. That kind of declines a little bit when we get the return of conservatism and the Republicans bringing in Harding and some of the others uh, in the 1920s. But then we see this coming back where collective bargaining or labor unions become more acceptable. They're not as tied to radical ideas as they had previously been. So because of this ability for labor to bargain with business owners, wages had gone up pretty significantly for everybody. So that's that higher standard of living that we're talking about. The other key feature that you need to recognize within the United States is all of that wartime production that we had discussed during World War II that put everybody back to work. Once the war was over, we really didn't stop producing wartime materials. Once we started the Cold War, which was almost instantly, there was this constant fear that the US had to be prepared to defend itself in case of some sort of an attack by the Soviet Union. So this military production continues. And because of this military production, you have a lot of people still working in defense industries, right? Um, people building battleships and um, fighter planes and tanks and, and all of these types of, of weapons that are being stockpiled in case they were needed. And we'll talk more about that military industrial complex in just a minute. But just know that this federal defense spending doesn't go away. There's still a huge, huge infusion of um, money, federal contracts within the private sector for them to build these um, military equipment. Um, internationally, the U.S. is also going to take a leadership role when we have this meeting. This was right at the end of World War II, 1944. There was a meeting in New Hampshire at the Britain Woods Conference, and you're going to have, you know, dozens of countries that are represented there, and it's, and it's carving out a plan for the international economy. And the two main features that come out of the Bretton Woods Conference will be the, the formation of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So what the World Bank was is, is more or less um, a repository where the various countries are, are contributing money and that money will go out as loans to countries that are trying to rebuild after the war. So that's part of it. And the US is taking a leadership role in um, organizing and funding this World Bank. Then the International Monetary Fund is also looking at trying to stabilize currencies and understand what the value of one currency is relative to the currency of another nation. If you can't understand how the two equate, how are you gonna be able to engage in trade? The International Monetary Fund is going to really set the US dollar as the standard around which the other currencies are going to be compared. So if you can compare your currency to the US dollar and have a um, kind of a set exchange rate, then you would also be able to compare your currency to another currency. 
So if you've got this standard that's being um, the, the basis, and that's going to be where we are with the International Monetary Fund. So again, the US is taking this leadership role in both of these efforts. Now, the, the idea, the ideal situation is if we go back to what John Hay had really wanted prior to World War I, when we saw the spheres of influence carving up uh, Asia and um, the expectation that the United States had for the open door policy, which would have been free and open trade anywhere in the world for any nation. That would have been the ideal arrangement here that was, um, was what they were trying to work towards. It doesn't end up happening that way, but it was um, kind of the, the goal that they had was open door trade for everybody. All right, Eisenhower serves his two terms as president. And by this point in the 1950s, that constitutional amendment has been added that restricts the president to only two terms. So he has served his two terms, really a, a relatively successful presidency. If you are looking at economic stability, if you're looking at uh, foreign policy, right? When he comes in, he makes that uh, threat to potentially use nuclear weapons in the Korean War and the Korean War, the fighting stops with the ceasefire. So we've got relative international peace during Eisenhower's administration and we have the growth of the middle class. We have people who are employed. So things are, are, are fairly good during Eisenhower's administration. When he leaves office, he gives a farewell address. Um, that's typical of many presidents where they give a speech um, to reflecting back on their terms, two term or two terms, and then also kind of um, making some recommendations for the future. And look what Eisenhower has to say. He's talking about this military industrial complex that we touched on a little bit in chapter 24. Look what he said, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. And what he's warning about is the potential for corruption now, he's not saying that there is widespread corruption. He's saying that the potential is certainly there. Um, so look at how this is set up. You've got the, um, the legislature that will pass laws that are going to approve funding for the weapons that the Department of Defense wants, right? Because they're in the height of the Cold War. The Department of Defense is saying, you know, we've got to stockpile all of this to make sure that we're secure and that we're ready in case we are attacked or we find ourselves in danger from the Soviet Union. So when they have this money to spend, they go out to private businesses to hire them to build the best new battleship, to build the best new fighter jet, to build the best new bomb, right? These are private companies that are being paid by money from the Defense Department that was given to them by the legislature. So look at where there are all um, possibilities for corruption here in this process. These private industries and companies and, and businessmen are giving money to campaigns, congressional campaigns. So there may be some sort of a link between these congressmen voting yes or no to appropriate funding for certain military projects. Then if they do appropriate those funds to the Defense Department, is the Defense Department putting pressure on the Department of Defense on which contractor to choose? Um, so again, in all of these steps, there's the possibility for um, corruption. And that's what Eisenhower is talking about. And I think where this gets even more traction is people remember that Nye Committee report that came out after World War I um, you'll remember the Nye Committee report was talking about the merchants of death and the businesses that profited off of World War I, um, the arsenal for democracy, the, the increase in, in volume of wartime materials that were being produced. And that was alarming. Eisenhower saying we've got to be careful and make sure we don't go down that road again. So this military industrial complex um, is keeping people employed in large parts and is keeping the economy very strong in the United States because we really don't scale back a lot from the, the previous production levels from World War II. All right, one other thing that the government does to try to ensure that the problems that existed after World War I when the soldiers came home and there was now more competition 
for jobs when people had filled in for them as they went off to war, they came back and now you've got more workers than you have jobs. They're gonna to try to resolve that here in World War II from the same situation from happening again by passing what's called the GI Bill of Rights. It's like the, the serviceman's um, policy and it, it's going to, to do a couple of things. It's going to automatically provide any war veteran with certain benefits. You may have heard of the Veterans Administration or the VA that's going to provide long-term health care for um, veterans. And it's going to, to provide um, various benefits all being run through this new Veterans Administration. There's also going to be an automatic payment of unemployment for one year for any soldier that does not immediately step back into a job. If you don't have a job, one of the other options available to you is to go to college. And in the 1950s, a very, very small proportion of the population went to college. I think today, you know, in a um, suburban area like Lassiter High School, you're going to see that 80 to 90 something percent of the graduating class will go to, a, to college of some sort. That was, it was almost reversed when you were looking at the 1950s. Maybe, maybe um, 10 to 15 percent of the population would go to college because it was so expensive and it was not as, um, necessary for some of those white collar jobs that we're talking about. But the GI Bill of Rights was going to pay for soldiers to attend college. Look what this does. One, it delays their entry into looking for a job. So if we can stagger that, um, that movement of people back into um, applying for jobs, then that's going to mean more of them are going to be employed. It also means that once they graduate from college, the kinds of jobs that they're looking for will be different. It will go more into that service sector, more into that professional business career or, or something else. The other thing the GI Bill offers as an alternative is to um, provide a government loan to build a house or start your own business. So look what that does, a couple of things. If you're getting this loan to go and build a house, that's not gonna be an extravagant house, but it's gonna be a, a house nonetheless, you're putting construction workers to work. And then if they start their own businesses, then they're hiring more workers. So all of this taken together was much more successful in making sure that the transition from wartime back to peacetime for veterans was much smoother than it had been after World War I. All right, consumerism, again, I said that this was really the kind of the defining part of domestic uh, the domestic situation in the United States in the 1950s. All kinds of new appliances that are going to make your home run more efficiently and that housework is more efficient. You've got an electric vacuum cleaner. You've got the sewing machine. You've got the I electric iron, um, the dishwasher, mixer. You know, you've got all of these appliances that are now available and affordable. The primary consumer item that everyone was interested in was the television. And it was very affordable. Again, you could buy it on an installment plan. And the growth of the television as a, a commodity that, that average Americans had was unbelievable. In 1947, so right after World War II, there were only about 7,000 televisions in the entire United States. So that would have been just the, 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 the very, very wealthy would have had a television. Three years later, by 1950, that number was 7.3 million televisions were in American homes. And then by 1960, you've got well over 85% of the homes in the United States had a TV. So this was very revolutionary, similar to the radio. And it's going to adjust the way a lot of things are going to be approached now that television has become kind of this more popular mode of mass media. Um, not as many people were going to go to the movie theater. If you could watch television at home for free, why would you go to the movie theater? I think that's kind of a, an interesting uh, commentary because we're kind of seeing the same thing today. You know, the movie theater was very, very popular up until I'd say maybe, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago when we started to have streaming services like Netflix and Hulu and some of the others where you can just watch movies on demand or, or TV shows on demand. I don't know that as many people go to movies and we're seeing more movie theaters begin to close. 
Um, but when you look at the programming that was on television during this early period of the 1950s, it was very, very limited in diversity. Um, if you look at these, these are some of the most popular shows on TV during the 1950s and 60s, Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, I Love Lucy. You see no diversity in those shows. Really, um, the only diversity of, of these three shows that you would find is in I Love Lucy. Lucy's husband, Ricky, is from Cuba. That's the only diversity that you would see in any of these shows. And the subject matter of the shows is very, very generic. They are not going to deal with anything remotely controversial. They're not going to deal with anything remotely tied to politics in these shows. And I think we can think, uh, we can probably assume why. We talked about the, the Red Scare in uh, post-World War II era and the House Committee on Un-American Activities where they were just really hard, hard um, honing in on the uh, Hollywood and um, television because they didn't want any sort of subversive messages going out on television. So they're not going to deal with common politics of the day, right? As controversial as you're going to get on these shows, maybe would be Wally on Leave it to Beaver and who he's going to take to the school dance. And, you know, he'd already asked one girl and then the other girl suddenly doesn't have a date and, and he's stuck, right? That's as controversial as it's going to get. And a lot of that has to do with the context of this being during the Red Scare. And they're not going to be dealing with any of those types of political situations. If you look at um, programming today, um, you know, there are a couple of shows and, and every once in a while they'll, they'll kind of throw in these little um, lines that are challenging in some ways, maybe the current president or maybe some sort of a policy that they may disagree with. You would have not seen any of that in the 1950s. One of the other um, parts to this is that it's going to change political campaigns because when it is an election year, not in any of, in of, any of these syndicated programs, but um, politicians are going to have to now not just give a great speech, now they've got to be able to come across on television very comfortably. Now we saw that a little bit in chapter 24 with the election of 1960 and the first televised debates that were between Kennedy and Nixon. And Nixon came off as a just a complete mess on those shows and he was very nervous. And Kennedy was just very put together, very calm, reserved. And it, it made people kind of gravitate toward Kennedy because he came across as more confident, more presidential. Uh, one of the other shows that was very popular and one of the other, other important aspects of television in the 1950s is their target audience. Um, a lot of the audience that is watching television are teenagers. These are, um, there is a huge consumer demographic of teenagers that now have their own money to spend because they're working in jobs. Um, you know, Great Depression, you, you didn't really have teenagers getting jobs because all of the adults were, were lacking of jobs as well. Teenagers had jobs in the 50s, they've got money to spend. Um, they've also got access to a car now, so there's more mobility. And so they're, they're going out and they're doing more things. A lot of the commercial ads on television were aimed at teenagers. Clear sill, right, for acne, um, other, other items that, that teenagers might be interested in. And then also one of the more famous shows in the 1950s was called Bandstand. You may have seen the play Hairspray or the movie Hairspray before where it's about these teenagers trying to get on this show where they have, they play the popular music of the time and the teenagers all dance. Um, that was really a show. Bandstand was incredibly famous. And my mom was a teenager in the 50s and she talks about how she and her friends would race home from school to watch Bandstand because it came on every afternoon at four o'clock. And so she would, um, she and her friends, they talk about how they tried to copy the hairstyles and they tried to copy what the, the girls were wearing. You know, so what became popular in one part of the country is popular everywhere, right? They were, they were living here in Roswell, Georgia in the 1950s, which was a very rural area at that time. Bandstand is being broadcast from somewhere else, some large city. But what became fashionable here in Roswell, Georgia was fashionable in every other city in America because all the kids were watching bandstands. So I think what, what you can take away from that is conformity, that you see 
a wide geographic area influenced by popular media. All right, um, rock and roll is another one of those um, important trends in the 1950s. And it starts here on the radio with Alan Freed. He was a disc jockey who began playing rock and roll music. And it's, um, it's kind of, it comes out of, of blues music, rhythm and blues music. And it's um, going to be very, very popular with teenagers once again. And the, one of the, the main um, rock and roll icons of the time was Elvis Presley. And he was a kid who was poor. He grew up in, in Memphis, didn't have a lot of money, um, but he had this um, voice that was, you know, just so unique and so dynamic. And he was recorded and he began to become incredibly popular. And he started to dress and sing and dance in a way that was very unusual for the time. Um, he went down to Beale Street in Memphis, which was part of the um, iconic area, blues area of um, the black community in Memphis. He went to Lansky Brothers, which was a, a clothing store on Beale Street. And his clothes were not typical of what a white teenager would have been wearing. Um, the way he danced was incredibly suggestive and um, provocative for that time period. And a lot of the adults were horrified by what they were seeing from Elvis and forbid their children to listen to him. Well, of course, once they are forbidden to listen to Elvis, they're gonna want more uh, to listen to him more than before. Eventually, Elvis is going to be on the Ed Sullivan variety show. And this came on Sunday nights and it was probably one of the more popular shows on TV for adults. And it was um, by a variety show. We're talking about Ed Sullivan is the host and then he has all of these guests who come on and appear on the show each week. And they may be musicians, they may be celebrities, actors, you know, just a, a wide variety of people would come on to the Ed Sullivan show and perform. It's sort of like, you know, if you think of Ellen, where Ellen has all of these guests and some of them are famous and some of them are not, um, but it's different every time. So that's what the Ed Sullivan show was. And Elvis Presley was invited to be on the Ed Sullivan show. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, what is he gonna do on the show? Um, the adults were a little concerned, but when they watched it, um, the first time that Elvis appeared on Ed Sullivan, they only were allowed to show him from the waist up. They couldn't show uh, his, his hips um, moving and dancing in a way that you know would have been suggestive of anything. But then he was on a couple of other times and Ed Sullivan got to know him pretty well. And at one point when he appeared on the show, I think it was the um, either at the end of the first time he was on or maybe the second time, Ed Sullivan puts his arm around Elvis and he looks into the camera and he tells the audience, this is a fine young man. And when Ed Sullivan basically gives his endorsement that Elvis is okay, that there's nothing dangerous about Elvis, the adults kind of backed off a little bit and Elvis just continued you know, his, his career um, just skyrocketed after that. Okay, there's also concern by the, the religious conservatives that all of this consumer materialism is once again drawing people away from their religious foundations. And we see this effort to try to, to focus that back in. Um, and this is also an effort to try to, to combat any sort of radical influence by communists, right? So this, you know, the, the communism and uh, the authoritarian dictators from Europe where they're controlling religion, I, is, religious ideas as well. That's all trying to be um, prevented in the United States. One of the things that we see is this emphasis on uh, religion within the foundations of the United States. So our money, they add in the phrase, in God we trust, two coins and bills uh, in the 1950s. They change up the Pledge of Allegiance and it becomes one nation under God. So those phrases were purposely added in the 50s to try to really uh, focus the foundation of the United States on religion. Now, not everybody in the United States thought that all of this conformity and everybody wearing the same styles and listening to the same music and watching the same TV shows was really a good thing. Um, some people thought that it stifled creativity and where's that going to lead us as we're in this you know, um, effort to try to, to build the best and the newest in technology. 
And if you're all about conformity, you're not doing anything that's original, that's fostering creativity. So this group that really is opposed to conformity in the 50s will be young people who are part of the artist community in New York and in California. And they're gonna be known as the beatniks. And the beatniks, they're the ones who aren't dressing like everybody else. They aren't uh, conforming to anything else and they're doing their own thing. Now, they're not a large group, but they're making a little bit of noise um, about the, the issues that maybe this isn't a great idea um, to continue down this path. The beatniks of the 1950s or the beats as they're sometimes called, begin to gain more attention. And by the time we get to the 1960s, um, there's going to be a much larger group of people that are kind of challenging the, uh, the system. And those would be known as the, the counterculture or the hippies. So the beatniks start this movement here in the 50s and it grows into the counterculture of the 60s. Um, one other thing that I meant to mention when we were talking about Elvis is the teenagers who begin to listen to Elvis in the 1950s. And his audience is going to be um, made up of white and black teenagers, right? So this is, this is music that crosses racial lines. He is a white performer. His sound is um, not typical of what you would find in the white community. And his audience is teenagers from both races. They're going to concerts together. They're interacting together. And there's a documentary that I would normally show um, in class and it's on, it's a documentary about Elvis. And the premise of, or their argument that they're making in this documentary is that these teenagers from the 1950s that are in some ways becoming desensitized to racism through rock and roll music become the adults in the 60s that are more willing to accept integration and um, an end and, and civil rights reform. So I think that's an interesting argument when you look at the timing of the background of, of people and where they've come from. All right, so uh, when we get into, again, the, the typical American family, again, you've got the television, people are watching the same shows. Um, and we also have a growth in the population, a spike in the population that we're gonna call the baby boom. During the Great Depression, the last thing families wanted were more children to have to figure out how they're gonna feed them. So between 1940 and 1955, when the economy has resolved itself, when we get out of World War II and there's prosperity, there is a spike in the population and we can watch the baby boom generation, right? So here would be the um, 19, if we're going, if this is showing 1970, if we go back to the 1930s, um, 40 years before, right? Look at this decline in the population. So there, that would be the Great Depression there. Here we have the baby boom generation and we can watch the baby boom generation age on these demographic um, charts. Here's 1985 coming behind the baby boom generation when we get into the 1960s and 70s, birth control becomes more readily available. And so there are fewer children um, that women are having and it's by choice and more women are, are having careers and working outside the home. So there is this bulge in the demographic population as they are moving up and we call this group the baby boomers. So if this is the time period of the, that's considered the baby boom, they would today be in their 70s and, and into their 80s. Um, so the, the population is aging and we can actually see that in current culture. If we look around, look at commercials on TV, there are all kinds of commercials for, you know, the little medic alert button that if you fall, you can push that button or the, the step in bathtub. Um, you've got all kinds of, of commercials that are targeting an audience that is making up a large portion of the viewers. Um, you've also got, I mean, how many of those assisted living communities do we see around Marietta today? They're everywhere. All of those um, communities that the elderly people, when they can no longer live at home by themselves because it's not safe, they move into these assisted living communities. So we can see this, um, this demographic beginning to age. And it's also, 
got some, some concerns as well. If you think about social security was put into place in the 1930s and into the 1940s. So this baby boom generation, this is a large part of the population while they're working, they're paying into the system but the people who are drawing social security make up a small proportion of the population. So you've got a lot of money going into the system and not as much money coming out. But look what we have now. The baby boom generation, they're now all drawing social security, but we have fewer people paying into the system than we have drawing out. So this is definitely the aging of the baby boomers is, is creating some different issues that have yet to be resolved. Okay, when the um, uh, 1950s rolls around, there's going to be a new approach to child rearing. And uh, Dr. Spock, Dr. Benjamin Spock, wrote this book, Baby and Child Care. And he's making some recommendations about not stifling the child in their development and allowing them to explore and allowing them to have um, freedom and not be confined by boundaries and always allowing the child to um, have free expression and that mothers shouldn't be away from the home, that they should be encouraging the child and nurturing the child sort of, you know, you can make this um, comparison in some ways with Republican motherhood from back during the earlier time periods where the, the, the mother was responsible for nurturing those good civic minded children. Um, and then also Dr. Spock was very much opposed to spanking children. Um, you know, by not confining a child, you know, maybe if you give a child crayons, give them just a blank sheet of paper, let them draw whatever they want to. Don't give them a coloring book and they have to stay within the lines. Let them be original, let them be creative. All right, this was a really popular approach in the 1950s. So now let's think about if that's the popular approach in the 50s, when those kids become teenagers in the 60s, we see a lot of teenagers pushing boundaries and, and not conforming to rules, right? And so that's the counterculture. We, we start to see how this approach to, um, to, to raising children can have some, some impact on how they're going to be living and approaching their lives later on. All right, now I'm not saying that everything Dr. Spock said was bad. I'm just saying it changes the approach. Okay, there's also um, the Kenzie report that comes out. And this is a um, study that was done on human sexuality. And they did surveys and they compiled a lot of data and reported on the, the more, um, the, the growing number of people who supposedly are engaged in premarital sex, which would have been larger than what people would have thought. There is a large discussion about homosexuality being more commonplace than was previously thought. And it was kind of taboo to talk about these subjects in, in public and, and certainly not publish these, these types of findings. So the Kenzie report was shocking to a many people who were very conservative in their moral values um, but this puts it out there and it opens up this discussion, more, more open discussion about sexuality in the late 50s. Um, then there's also, as we get into the 60s, late 50s and into the 60s, and you've got kids who are pushing the envelope and they're being promiscuous and they're getting involved in um, behavior, smoking and drinking underage and all these kinds of things. The government wants to know why, what's causing this, what's making this group of teenagers act in the way that they are. So the Estes Kefauver was a um, member of Congress and he launches this investigation with a committee and they issue their report. It's called the Kefauver Report on Juvenile Delinquency. And what they assert is that violence in comic books and that the rock and roll music and the suggestive behavior in that music is what's fostering these kids to misbehave. And so he is urging censorship to get rid of rock and roll music. Don't allow it to be played on radio stations in your area. Um, scale back these comic books and the um, portrayal that they give for this violent behavior. So again, there's, there's becoming more of a clash between the younger generation and the older generation. 
about what is socially acceptable in the time period. All right, so the final thing that we wanna look at are the suburbs and the growth of the suburbs. And so here you've got this family with their car and their home and their lawn and the other houses all look the same. Um, and that was um, definitely something that, that booms in the 1950s, largely through the GI Bill, largely through this effort by a guy named William Levitt. And he's going to produce what were known as Levitt towns in suburbs across the United States. And these were more or less, like we talked about, um, a kit that the house could be built start to finish in record time and very affordable because they're all exactly the same. So here is a Levitt Town community. Every one of these houses on every one of these streets is identical. Now they try to, to make it at least a little more interesting by making some of the roads curved in some ways but it's just you clear cut area and you build these houses and they're all exactly the same and very, very affordable. Now, they're not fancy, they're not big, but it allows people in the middle class to now move out to the suburbs into homes that they can afford. Previously, the suburbs would have been a place as we saw in the 1920s where the wealthy upper class would move out to the suburbs because they were the ones who had cars and could drive back into the city. Now. You've got um, affordability of the suburbs, and now we've got upper class and now the middle class largely moving into the suburbs from the urban areas, right? Give your child a yard to play in rather than a street to play in from a, um, you know, a high rise apartment building or something like that. So what we end up finding is that in the cities, when you remove the upper class and the middle class, you're left with poverty just defining these urban areas. And with that poverty, you've got issues related to crime. You've got unemployment. You're going to have, um, this is called de facto segregation, where it is more or less white flight. The people who have the jobs that are paying more money are white, and they would be the ones who would be moving out at this point into the suburbs. And so what you end up with it's not mandated by law, the segregation of communities, but it happens because of economic disparity. We call that de facto segregation. Um, so these suburbs become very, very um, homogeneous in terms of the white population, and they are being built by William Levitt, and we call these Levitt towns. I would be very familiar with that. Okay, the other thing that will connect all of these major cities in the United States is probably the main program that Eisenhower was known for. So if you, you know, if you think about Eisenhower, you've got the end of the Korean War, you've got the consumerism, but then the big project that he is going to be instrumental in, in getting through and passed is the Interstate Highway Act. And what, you know, at the height of the Cold War, we've got a large geographic area that covers the, that the United States spans. So if there is a nuclear attack that is imminent, we've got to be able to move military equipment as quickly as possible from one location to another across this vast geographic area. And before we had interstate highways, you know, think about driving from uh, Atlanta to Florida, but you can't use I-75 and you've got to go through these little towns and you've got all the stoplights and the uh, stop signs and they just kind of wind around and they don't go in a direct path from one major city to the other. The Interstate Highway Act is initially set up as a defense measure that we've got to connect every major city in the United States with a highway that is going to allow maximum speed to move military equipment. Um, that's why you don't see traffic lights on an interstate highway. It's, it's just one big fast, thoroughfare um, that the government just happens to allow cars on. So it was initially set up as a military uh, investment, but it's also going to improve transportation for um, products to be moved from one place to the other and also just move people who, uh, who are going on vacation. So you can see the map, this is the interstate highway system and it was a massive undertaking. It cost, um, I think it was over a billion dollars to build this and construct this highway system. And it does get completed in the 1950s and 1960s. Along the way, you'll notice these blue Eisenhower interstate system signs. 
So if you are going anywhere over the next few weeks um, that requires a highway, I want you to look for those blue Eisenhower interstate system signs. All right, um, there's also a shift in the population to the Sun Belt. We see a lot of people leaving these industrial centers in the north from Boston, from Pittsburgh, from um, you know, Eric Columbus in Ohio, Chicago, Detroit, all of these areas that were heavily industrial areas of production. And they're moving to the Sun Belt where we begin to see more defense production. By that, we're talking about like, look in Marietta, we've got Lockheed, which was probably the largest of the, the private companies that built fighter jets starting in the 60s, 50s and 60s. So that brought a lot of jobs to Georgia. You've got Silicon Valley as we begin to get more computerized technology in the 50s and 60s, that's centered in California. The space race, NASA centered in Houston, Texas and in uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. So the Sun Belt is going to spread from about South Carolina through the deep south into the west of California. And we have a huge influx of, the, of, of people moving from the north to the south because of more production in the defense industry and in the technology industry. So in the Sun Belt, that's going to be very important. If you think about military bases, the vast majority of the military bases in the United States are in the south because of the warm weather, not limiting the um, movement of military equipment. All right, so is this really an ideal situation? So when we talk about the 1950s being about prosperity and consumerism and um, relative peace internationally in the midst of a Cold War, um, is it really ideal for everybody? No, right? You've got terrible situations in the urban areas with poverty. Um, we've got definite um, division in terms of the races and even more segregation than before, now that we are physically segregating people uh, in communities. And then is it really great to everyone be doing the same thing? Is that really a good quality of life that you are trying to fit into this mold that somebody else is telling you is the right way to live? versus doing what you want to do. So there are some questions here that will spill over into the counterculture of the 1960s. Uh, in those urban areas where there was extreme poverty, by the 1960s, there are riots that break out um, and they are very destructive. Some of the worst of those riots take place um, in Detroit um, and then also in Watts, which is a, a, a neighborhood within Los Angeles. And the president, um, Lyndon Johnson at the time in 1968, orders an investigation. What is causing all of this turmoil in the urban areas? And uh, Senator Kerner is going to head up this commission, the Kerner Commission, and it's made up of Democrats and Republicans. And they're going to go into these urban areas. They're going to be looking at data. They're going to be doing interviews. They're going to be investigating the root cause of of the problems in the urban areas. And look at what the report says, that the main cause of urban violence is white racism. The report calls for social programs to provide jobs and housing for African-Americans and the end to de facto segregation, where we're talking about white flight out of the urban areas and that this poverty situation is escalating um, and that it's due to white racism. And then this is probably the main phrase that comes out of the Kerner Commission report. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. So this last phrase is really referencing the Plessy decision, Plessy versus Ferguson saying that separate um, but equal is okay. And the Kerner Commission report is saying this isn't working. So we're really on the road to having civil rights legislation being implemented um, you've got the Voting Rights Act that's already been passed in 65 and the Civil Rights Act in 64, but the poverty piece has not yet been dealt with. All right, so as we finish up here, we will begin our study of the Civil Rights Movement in chapter 26. So until then, keep reading and go make history.